Hey everyone, Fearcrawler here. Welcome to the video. Minicrawler and I were just playing hide and seek in the basement. It's kind of fun, but somebody keeps turning off the lights and revving a chainsaw. Weird. You guys are in for an extra special treat today. We've got five super silly, PG rated, completely bloodless, bring the children, not at all scary, family friendly, happy ending, popcorn and soda, creepy pastas. And that should cover all my bases to get this video monetized. Enjoy! Three months ago, I woke up and I went outside to take out the trash bins. I noticed that there were posters stuck to the light posts and telephone poles all up and down the street, like the kind people put up when they've lost something. I went to have a look and I noticed that all of the posters were exactly the same. That wasn't the odd part though. You see, every single poster was a picture of my face with the word missing printed on the top. The posters also said that I had lived in an address that I didn't recognize as one I had ever lived at. This started making me nervous. I got curious and I went to the address listed on the poster. The place looked old and abandoned like it hadn't been lived in for many years. I found an open window and I took a look inside the house. It was absolutely disgusting, putrid, and gory. Strewn all about the floor were the limbs and heads of dead people, all mangled and chopped into pieces. As I slowly backed my head away from the window, a man's face peered at me from out of the darkness, mere inches from me. I felt frozen as his eyes locked with mine, their colors shimmering and shifting along with the locks of hair upon his head, all the colors changing in a mesmerizing fashion, like a hypnotist wheel. I ran away from the property as fast as my legs could move, but quickly found myself surrounded by a mob of crying people. They had me completely trapped between them, loudly expressing how glad they were to have finally found me. They said they wanted to take me back to the house on the poster. Some of them grabbed onto me and tried to force me back towards that disgusting house, but I fought back. During the struggle, I saw my parents among the crowd. They were wallowing in tears of joy for having at last found their missing son. I screamed to my parents that I was never missing, and they knew that we all lived in the same house, but they kept on telling me how happy they were that they had found me and that they were going to take me back to where I live, back to that house from the missing poster. I shouted at the crowd that I was never missing, and everyone needed to release me. The ones who had grabbed onto me kept on telling me that I had been found, and I needed to go back. By this time, I had been dragged back onto the property, just a few feet from the house. I could see that man's face again, inside the open window. He was smiling at me menacingly. I managed to free one of my arms and delivered a sharp punch to the jaw of one of my captors, causing him to release his grip on my arm. I broke free of the group and ran back to my home. My real home. I've locked myself inside my room. People are still trying to search for me. I can still see them outside my window. The missing person posters are still there. I saw the crowd murder my parents for abducting me. This is insane. I need to escape this town. Here is what I want to look like and what I've always wanted to look like. When you look at me, I want you to know and think it was me who let out the cryptid crawling creatures from another dimension. I want to look like I did something on purpose, like letting out interdimensional snakes on people, seeing the interdimensional snakes going inside people and mixing with their bodies. It looks so bizarre and unusual. I want to look like I did that, and I am that. I want to look like that I hate this dimension, and I want to mix it with more hazardous dimensions. I want to look like I fit in a bloodbath in some mansion or inside a wrecked abandoned house. I want to look like that I can adapt and enjoy being in places where people painfully trying to be turned to look like other creatures from another world. That's the kind of look I want. I want to look like that I've been bathing in their blood 
and whilst they're excruciatingly painfully being turned to be like and to look like other creatures from another world, I want to look like I am comfortable breathing in poisonous gas. I want to look like I'm the one that summoned insane people to cut people up until they find a creature who is just hiding in someone else's skin. I want to look like I do those things and I am those things. I want to look like a certain way that when people look at me, they think they're at death's door, another world, and that something is happening to them or has happened to them. I want to look like I'm operating on them and that I took out whatever thing they've been pregnant with, even though they've never been pregnant before. That is what I want to look like. I've recently started working a new job in an office, and everything is pretty much okay. The only advice I got in my training was to be patient when it was time to go home. Yesterday was my first official day working, and during my training I only work half days. During the last hour of the shift, I was working at my usual pace. I could feel a sudden intense feeling in the air. Everyone was looking at each other in such a paranoid fashion. I remember being told that the company is constantly hiring people, as they kept on losing employees. As soon as it was time to go, everyone started fighting for the door, like they needed to hurry to get out of the office. They all started fighting with each other. First it was just yelling and pushing, and then it was hitting, and then it became even more violent. The workers began clawing and biting each other. Then fingers began digging into eye sockets and pulling out the eyes. They were all so desperate to go home. I was just waiting for the chaos to calm down. When it finally had, I got up and walked over the dead bodies and the few living co-workers who were crawling blindly on the ground. Their eyes, ears, and even a few limbs were now missing. It was good advice to be patient when it's time to go home after a shift. No wonder the company is constantly hiring new people. I got out of the office an hour late. As I was going out the door, another co-worker had blocked me a little. He was crawling on the floor looking for his eyes. Suddenly I felt this immense anger take over me as that exit sign flickered overhead. I beat him to death. I have no idea what came over me. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk, and please, the more the merrier. When I talk to you about sentimental feelings, people always piece that together with love and positive emotional attachment. To me, sentimental feelings can be about hatred and revenge. Like when I got revenge on my high school teacher who said I would never amount to anything. He was right about that, but I killed him anyhow for being right. The knife that I killed him with has a connection with me now, and a certain kind of sentiment of the opposite kind, and I like it. My high school teacher's dead body also holds the sentimental attachment of the opposite kind. Whenever I look at that knife, I never use it for cooking purposes, but it reminds me of how I killed someone who was right about how my life would go, and I killed him for being right. That's the kind of sentiment that knife has towards me now. When my teacher's body was rotting away, I found that the sentimental feelings I had towards his dead body was not rotting away, but becoming more lifelike as such. I found a new kind of sentiment that had probably always existed, but people turned away from noticing it. It's like when soldiers talk about the gun that they had used to kill the enemy and that gun or sword or tank machine will hold a different kind of sentiment compared to a necklace that your beloved grandmother gave to you. That knife now, whenever I look at it, I sometimes cry because it was used to stab and kill the guy who was spot on about how much of a failure I'd become. Even though I killed him, my teacher that is, even when he's dead, he's still becoming more right every second about how much of a failure I am and I'm still a failure. That's the kind of sentiment I have towards this knife and his dead body. It's a reminder to me about my competition to prove my teacher wrong. Now every second, 
I'm always proving him right, even though he's dead. Who else can say that they have this kind of sentiment toward an object or a body? And I am sure that there's others out there like me that are too scared to admit. That knife that I killed my teacher with, even though I used it to kill him. But now, I'm scared of using this knife to even cut onions, as I'm scared of it being used for violence. That is what having the opposite kind of sentimental feelings for an object feels like when I look at my teacher's bones now how it embarrasses me even more because this dead thing has and is accurately proving that my life is a failure. The main thing is, though, that I don't want to be successful anymore because I don't want to lose that sentimental attachment that I have with the knife or my teacher's dead body. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. I have two friends named David and Larry. The three of us came to the park the other day to play on the swings. It was just a casual day. David went on the swings while Larry pushed him as hard as he could. David was an ordinary fellow with no real problems or issues. But when he went on the swings that day, something was off with him. Whenever the swing took him high up in the air, he became unusually happy, almost like he was on something. And when the swing came back down, he would suddenly become extremely angry, like he wanted to hurt someone. It was so strange to watch this. Larry didn't want to keep pushing David after observing his behavior on the swings and how pushing him seemed to be affecting his moods. The swings were literally mood swings, complete with each high and low action being accompanied with a high and low emotional response. When David was up in the air, he was so happy. And when he was back down, he had the anger of a killer. Larry stopped pushing David, and the swing slowed to a stop. David casually slid himself off the swing, walked over to the only other person in the park at that time, and murdered him. We ran to David quickly and managed to force him back onto the swings. Larry continued to push David as I dragged the man's lifeless body over to the empty swings and placed him inside it. Larry and I took turns pushing David and the man's body. As the park became more crowded throughout the day, we got more people to join in and take turns pushing David on the swings, while Larry and I pushed the body of the man. David is always super happy when the swing is high up in the air. The body of the person David had killed is also happy when the swings go high up in the air, but angry when it comes down. We've got to push two people on the swings now. We can never stop pushing. Such heartwarming stories. Hit you right in the old cockles of the heart, doesn't it? I hope all of you enjoyed. Thank you so much for sticking around until the end. I'm going to get back to playing with Mini Crawler. Oh, Mini Crawler, you are just too funny. Oh, seriously, now you're starting to freak me out. <laughs>